you are listening to Kubernetes Byte, a podcast bringing you the latest from the world of cloud-native data management. My name is Ryan Walner, and I'm joined by Bob and Shaw, coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. We'll be sharing our thoughts on recent cloud-native news and talking to industry experts about their experiences and challenges managing the wealth of data in today's cloud-native ecosystem. All right. Thanks for joining Kubernetes Bytes podcast. We're live here at DevOps Days uh, Boston. Um, so a hometown event for yep. us, I guess you could say. And we're joined by, why don't you introduce yourself? Yep. So my name is uh, Alexandre Poels, or just Alex is fine. Okay. Uh, it's the French version of uh, Alexander, but oh. uh, no one can ever pronounce the R-E at the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm here because I, I did um, a talk yesterday about sort of my vision on how to model uh, platform engineering and developer platforms and I have this whole thing about drawing an analogy between um, what a computer, the layers that build up a computer, the layers of abstraction that build up a computer, and how you can translate that into how you can build layers of abstraction in the same way in your in your cloud infrastructure. Awesome. And I attended that talk, Alex. That was a good one, right? I, I like even when you started the talk, you said you have already helped a couple of organizations build these IDPs. And even though IDPs are like brand new, I, I just wanted to know, like, okay, when did you start? What does what does that implementation look like? And then maybe focus more on your talk at DevOps Days Boston. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, people say that IDPs are a new concept. I think IDPs are just a word applied to a concept <laughs> yes. that we've been trying to build for the last 20 years or so. But uh, yeah. I would say it started, you know, when my first job out of college, I was working at IBM on the um, IBM blockchain platform team. And we were looking to automate sort of the creation of uh, customer blockchain networks. And that's when I first started working with infrastructure and automation. And I was pulled into the dark side of Kubernetes. I still remember my manager <laughs> explaining to me, all right, this is what a pod is. It's a collection <laughs> of containers. And I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. Um, and then from there, I moved on into a fintech startup. And I was originally supposed to do blockchain stuff with them, but as a startup does, you know, we ended up having to, to wear many hats. And one of them was, I was like, I'm sick and tired of manually putting this thing on an EC2. So I'm going to automate this for you. And that's when I really started to develop an opinion on, on what, you know, how it should work. And initially, I'm very passionate about open source and supporting open source products. And uh, I just see a lot of uh, companies using as a service systems, yep. you know, because they're like, oh, it's faster and we don't have to maintain it. And um, I keep hearing this term TCO, right? Total cost Part, of ownership. Yeah. Like, well, we could self-host and it'd be cheaper on a monthly basis, but then we have to support it. And what's the amount of work involved with that? And I just fundamentally didn't believe that necessarily. <laughs> I was like, I just don't think it's that hard to maintain these, these self-hosted products. And so I wanted to go out and, and prove that. And I wanted to automate the life cycle of, of self-hosting open source. And that's sort of what I've done with, with the developer platform that I've built. Gotcha. So is it just you working on the developer platform or... You have a team now. No, so it was just me for a long time. <laughs> okay. And I did the classic engineer thing when you make a startup that you should never do. And I've known that the hard way, which is like, I want to write code. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I've developed this platform in a vacuum based on my experiences, having built developer platforms in the past for about a year. And then I was like, all right, I guess now it's time to sell and market it. I know how to do the code thing. I don't know how to do this sales and marketing thing. And I've learned a lot of things about why you should, you should not do exactly what I did. Um, you should really find your customer first, build a thing for them, and then, and then deploy it. But so I was alone. I've recently hired someone to help me with sort of outbound and communicating with people and contacting people. Um, and really what we're trying to do now is what I should have done earlier, which is I'm reaching out to companies who are building their developer platforms, who are trying to improve their infrastructure and saying, hey, I'm trying to do things that gets you 90% of the way there right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. rather than spending the next six to 12 months just building out your base level of need. And I would just like to talk to you and get some feedback. And I'm not trying to sell anything to you. You know, it's open source anyways. Like, yep. all right. And I just want to know if, am I solving a real problem for a real person? And so that's, that's what I'm doing, me and, and the guy that I hired. That's awesome. Like, okay, it, I agree with your statement, right? Yeah. Like people are spending the next six to nine months figuring out if they should build or buy something. So uh -huh. that's a perfect place to be in. Can you also talk a bit more about DevOps and DevSecOps? I know you focused a lot around that in your session yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when it comes to DevOps and, and DevSecOps, I think there's a lot of products that try and solve a specific subproblem, and, and no, no hate to them. Like for, you know, there's a lot of products like, that focus on solving the zero trust problem or focus on, and I'm a big, uh, I love Alton Brown. I do a lot of okay. Alton Brown recipes, and Alton nice. Brown keeps talking about single-use items and multi-use items. Yeah. And I think you can get a huge amount of value, um, and you can solve these sort of complex problems, like how am I zero trust, and how do I do this, without having to 
take a specific problem that solves a specific problem that solves that particular problem. If you assemble these complex multifaceted products in a way where they all communicate with each other, all these other problems are solved along the way. And when we talk about DevSecOps, if we look at the security one in particular, um, one big thing in security and zero trust, right, is making sure that every single request, every single part of your infrastructure is authenticated. Like we know who did it, we know yep. why they did it, we specifically authorize them to do it. And there's a lot of specific problems that do that. Well, if you just look at combining Istio, right, which is a service mesh that runs in Kubernetes, and an identity management platform, which you could go as a service like Okta or Auth, or you sure. could self-host open source, which is Keycloak, you can actually make those things communicate with each other in a way that you solve that problem internally just because they're integrated with each other. So you can tell Istio, communicate with my IDP, make sure that the JWT has these specific claims that it's signed by this specific person. And then if it's not, deny the request to the container, right? And the container now, the code, doesn't have to do all that logic internally, yep. right? The developer doesn't have to rewrite that code for every single service they deploy. All they have to do is read a header. And if the request even made it there in the first place, that means that it was authorized. And if you want another layer of security, the code can check the JWT again, right? And so I'm just trying to get people, my whole platform is about taking these basic blocks and combining them in the best way possible that each of them does multiple things in the best way possible. And you don't have to go out and get these specific products. So do you have like a, a prescribed list of different projects that you put together from the open source <laughs> landscape to help? Okay. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I like to break it down into five verticals like I did in my presentation, right? Yep. So you have your CI CD, um, you have your identity management, your config management, your observability, and then your networking, which is your service mesh. And then for each of those, I pick an open source implementation. So um, do, you, do you want me to give you some of those yeah, examples? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so for CI, right, I'm using Tekton, which allows me to run my pipelines in Kubernetes. For my CD, I use Flux, which basically allows me to define the state of my cluster in a GitHub repo. Oh, yeah. And that's the other thing I say is that um, a UI should be read only. Like I don't believe in clicking buttons. Like That's why we have Terraform. Like, if we build Terraform so we can write code, uh, to def and, and, and we can track it with Git commits, then why are we, why are we making platforms that make us click buttons again? Sure. We're just going to make a Terraform module that clicks the yeah. button for us in the platform, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, right, so I said CD for Flux for um, identity management. I love Keycloak. Um, yeah. You know, they, they've had a rough pass, but they're really getting really good, and I think their features really rival any of the as-a-service products. Uh, for config management, I use HashiCorp Vault. There's quite a few competitors out there for Vault that I'd like to explore as well, but that's what I use for now. And then for observability, I like the Grafana stack. Uh, and I like the Grafana stack particularly because my issue when I've built observability in other places is that uh, if you're self-hosting it, you also have to self-host a rather complex database. Yep. Um, one thing I don't like doing on Kubernetes is anything that requires a state in the form of a PVC. The moment you have a persistent volume in Kubernetes, it starts to get a little more complicated to manage. Yep. Uh, and what I like about the Grafana stack is they stick everything in S3. Yeah. yeah and there's yeah. nothing more simple than just sticking everything in S3. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, I mean, it's 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 a little avoidable if you can use something like object, right? Yeah. But there are some cases like running databases on Kubernetes. Obviously, that yeah. It's hard to get away from not, you know, caring about the PVC. Yeah. And here I'm going to sneak away in a corner and tell you that all my databases are fully managed on RDS. <laughs> there, there you go. So, you know, it's, it's you know, we've we've interviewed, well, I think, a bunch of folks yeah. who do manage state on Kubernetes. And we find that they, they tend to go in a couple different camps, which is, one, they probably just use a managed service and say, well, I don't want to deal with it. And they do a good enough job. And, you know, and so you just let them go for it. So. It's a totally fair answer, right? The same answer as like, you don't have to do Kubernetes in the first place in <laughs> half the time. So, you know, that's, that's fun. So how many developers are actually using the IDP that you built now? So uh, I, uh, an early version of the IDP I built, I put out in the second company that I helped uh, yeah. build these things. And they had a development team that was about 20, 20 30 people. Okay. Right now, I'm, I'm trying to actually get more people to look at my IDP. So I, you could say zero, unfortunately, <laughs> right? No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, I'm trying to get people to look at it and tell me if, if it's useful, if, it, if this is an interesting thing for me. I'm struggling because uh, for startups, like I think a lot of startups just want to do the things on their own in the yeah. cheapest way possible. And they're not yeah, looking sure. at getting something off the shelf. Yeah. And also the price of running all these different services together on Kubernetes is going to be like, yeah. like I said, 2,500 to 3,000 a month. And sometimes a startup, especially if they don't have any sort of seed investment, is not looking to do that. Right. So I'm looking to reach people above a certain scale. Yeah. Uh, and then those people are either hard to talk to or there's a huge amount of switchover friction because once you've reached that scale, yeah. you actually have already a particular, it may not be the best way of doing things, but yeah. 
it certainly works and I totally get that. Like, yeah. you know, if it works, it works. And you got to convince them like it's worth it to go through all that friction to switch over to a new way of doing things. Right, right. Um, and like I how think, do you bolt on what they're already using? Yeah, right? it's, In it's, some hard, cases, it's yeah. hard to just, you got to find that smallest. And usually what I tell people is just pick that one service, like yeah. one thing that would be simple, right? Mm -hmm. Stand up what, I'm, what I've got, you know, yeah. this open source platform and try and switch that one service to it. Yeah. And if you like it, you can switch another and yeah. then another and then another. You don't have to do it all, like, all at once, you know, just, just a little bit at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, so with this platform that you're kind of building, uh -huh. is the idea for someone to be able to take this and kind of like stand it all up in one motion, sort of like all automated and, and, and sort of scripted in the mm -hmm. sense that you can hand this over to, you know, a team or someone with that one service and say, you know, here's how to do it. Or like, do they have to install everything individually and, and know how to do it? No, themselves? so the idea, right, and uh, I also, uh, the whole thing about my platform is I don't want you to depend on a new tool that I have to write. I want yeah. only to use tools that you're familiar with. Okay. So all it is, it's a set of Terraform modules, okay. which you run in order. Yep. Okay, one of them sets up your AWS orgs. One of them sets up a database. One of them sets up your Kubernetes cluster, right? Like yeah. I said, you bootstrap different layers of the hardware stack in the presentation. Um, and then the other component of it is that GitOps repo, which sets sure. up the inside of the Kubernetes cluster. Right. So the idea is that within a single day, you know, an engineer could run the modules in order, point flux at that GitOps repo, they get everything set up, and then they're able immediately to start publishing services to it. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, and so, <coughs> Alex, one question around, like, IDPs, right? Building your own in an open source way, that's perfect. But have you looked at backstage? How does that compare? Are there... Did you realize that there were challenges that it doesn't solve for with its architecture that you had to like go down your own path? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I boil that, just, I boil that down to opinion. So I think Backstage tries to be un, as unopinioned as possible, which is awesome because uh, you can basically build it to do it anything you want, any way you want. Yep. Uh, the way that I build things, I'm saying, all right, I'm claiming that there's a better, a best quote unquote way of doing this, which I know I'm, <laughs> immediately <laughs> someone's going to come and hit me with a hammer the moment I said that. But there's a generally good way of doing this. And what's difficult about building IDPs is not necessarily finding tools. There's a lot of great tools that do a lot of different things. It's like I said, linking them together yeah. in the best way possible. And when you start linking things together, you immediately start implying opinion of I think they should be linked this way. Sure. And so what I would say the major differentiator between what I built is I'm saying rather than spending a bunch of time customizing backstage, Mine works right away because it's built in an opinionated way and they're all linked right out of the box in a way that makes them, provides you all these really cool features like really high security yep. and your CI pipelines work right away. You don't have to write them right now. All the interfaces have been set so that you just have to write a Docker file, push your code and it just starts working. Um, so yeah, it would be, it'd be opinion. That would be what I would say. It's, okay, that makes a, sense. Yeah. Okay, so I guess one last question for me. Have you attended DevOps Days Boston before, or is this your first time? And how how do you like it so far? So this is my first time. I used to live in Somerville uh, okay. when I worked uh, near Boston. I went to school at WPI. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, this is my first <laughs> DevOps Days. Um, I, I you know I live in Lisbon, so it was a bit of a travel, but I decided to make it into a bit of a trip. You know, see all the friends I haven't seen in a while. Yeah. Go to New York. Um, this is my first, but this is my first DevOps days, and I'm really really happy to be here to meet you guys. I've had lots of fantastic conversations with really smart people. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to also learn from them and maybe plug in some of the improvements they've, they've suggested yeah. into my own platform. Yeah, I feel like the open spaces do a really good job of giving you that platform to say, here, I want to talk about this topic or maybe yeah. there's one you've already been interested in. So um, how do people find out more about what you're doing? Like, how do they connect with you or the project you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So you can either reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. I'm just uh, AJ Powell's, you know, Alexander Powell's. You can go to my website. The name of the platform is Bitmantle, B-I-T-M-A-N-T-L-E. There's a whole philosophical idea behind <laughs> Bitmantle. We protect it. It's like the mantle of the earth. It's like the foundation of your infrastructure. Nice. But I like, like it. I yeah. like it. Yeah. Uh, so bitmantle.com works. Um, and then you can also, since it's open source, you can go to, I'm currently switching. I'm in the process of switching from, originally my company was Powell's Labs um, because that was just sort of like, oh, I want to put all my ideas in one place, Powell's sure. Labs. And yeah. then Bitmantle is like the product that came out of okay. it. Uh, there's been other products that came out of Powell's Labs, more based in like the data security and privacy space. Right. But yeah, so Bitmantle or just contact me on LinkedIn. And my, my email is alex at bitmantle.com. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us here and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. Have a great day.
All right, welcome to Kubernetes Bytes, Kevin. Um, we're here live in Boston. Thanks for joining us. Why don't you give a little introduction for our listeners about who you are and what you're doing? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Kevin Schinneman. I'm a staff SRE at Takeoff Technologies. Um, I've been there for four years. Um, I've seen the gamut from uh, going from Docker Compose to Kubernetes and now on to serverless technologies. So I've witnessed it all. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had the pleasure of working with you about four years ago now. Uh, I noticed Correct. you left out the whole OpenStack piece there. Was that yeah, maybe on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> That is correct. I think I think all of those brain cells of OpenStack have uh, uh, left my brain. So uh, maybe maybe for the better, maybe not. Um, yeah. Anyway, so what brings you to DevOps Days Boston? I know it's not your first, so tell right. us a little about your experience here. Yeah, I've been coming to DevOps Days for probably I don't know exactly how many years, but probably six to eight years. Um, way before I was here at the Cyclorama, um, it's always good to hear uh, you know what other people are working on or um, their experiences. Um, in the DevOps world, even in platform engineering, um, all that kind of stuff. And it's good to hear those high level, you know, things. And even like the burnout one was very interesting this morning. Sure. So, cause that was not technology specific or just general. <laughs> we like to run so fast and then, uh, have to just slow down a little bit. I wonder if talks like that, like burn, I didn't attend it, but it's a common theme on, if you go to many conferences in this space, yep. I'm wondering if we're scaring away people from getting <laughs> into, into this type of thing. Um, t tell me a little bit more about the talk and, and maybe your, do you, have you ever experienced kind of an influx or burnout in, in your SRV job? Oh, for sure. Um, as far as the, the presentation went, it was, um, basically how you know how to identify burnout in yourself and um how you can uh, mitigate some of that either by getting a new job or <laughs> or just taking vacation or um all that stuff so that was very good to, to hear some of that um as far you know as far as burnout in my my personal life yeah i definitely experienced that from time to time where i'm just running so fast in fact i probably hit that right now <laughs> okay. working on the project right. i'm like you just hit a point where it's like all right i gotta take a break switch to something else and I can yep. come back to it, you know, to, to just give a mental break from yeah. what you're working on. Yeah, definitely. I, I saw an analogy it. the other day about, you know, us as humans in the workplace, um, how we're always sort of like acting as a, like a spring. We should always be striving for more to get to the next place. And, 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 but at the same time, our human bodies yeah. sleep every night. Right. Right. And so if you take a, a wider look, we should also be able to sort of, not sleep per yeah. se, but, you know, take those uh, breaks to rejuvenate ourselves. Right. Um, I know a lot of uh, people that believe in sort of like, you know, work seven days a week, 24 seven and, you know, yep. God bless them if they, if they can work that way, but some people just aren't built that way. So yeah, I think burnout is real, but at the same time, like, you know, I think it's also part of the information age that we're in. It doesn't just stop at sort of our, our daily lives in technology. We're just flooded with new stuff, new new parts of the stack new yep. pieces of devops all oh, the time yes. right yes. so um i guess like how has to you the topics since you've been coming to devops days yeah. for a long time how has they changed over the years i have to kind of think about that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have changed a lot for sure from the first days to today you know now i think uh, early on it was more geared towards like you know ci cd and like automation wow. and and those kind of things and i think you know, as we've already done all that stuff and moving more forwards, it's like thinking about like, you know, platforms and, um, you know, obviously thinking about more observability and, and those type of things. And so those are the talks that are coming out this year, um, you know, it, first years past, but then we're also leaving out people who are brand new to DevOps. Yeah. And so I, you know, one of the nice things that Paul and Don and the, and the group has done is, is brought in that one-on-one track um, to, to, to guide new people who don't understand DevOps or automation or what it really means um, to, to help them get up to speed to, you know, for these later talks or more advanced talks. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. Kevin, I wanted to ask more about your personal journey, right? Like you right. said, you have been doing SRE for the past five years. Sure. How has SRE treated you and what, what are your thoughts about DevOps or platform engineering titles, oh, which right. are kind of <laughs> responsible for the same thing, but yeah, just different titles. Yeah. I think in my opinion, like, uh, there's two different things. I mean, SREs, you know, came out of the Google world and, mm -hmm. you know, reliability and focus on reliability, yep. less about platforms, but 
um, there was a talk, I think it was last year, um, from one of the Google SRE people, and they were mentioned like, you know, platforms could come out of, um, could, you know, comes out of SRE because it's like, you, you know, right. you're supporting the, the dev, dev teams and you still need, you know, eventually a platform. Mm -hmm. And then we used to have this focus on platform engineering as well. So it's kind of the two aspects. I think um, at a really big organization, probably at Google, they probably have both, right? They yep. have SRE and a platform team, right? right. And the SRE supports, plat yeah, so on and so forth. Do you but, think the platform side of the boat there in that yeah. example is more tied to sort of the dev developer experience in sort of what that platform is versus, you know, keeping the lights on kind oh, of thing. Oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Because like, yeah, the platform engineering, their, their role is to, uh, you know, reduce that, um, you know, lead time to, to production yep. and the developer experience and getting uh, new, new ideas out, out the door much quicker. Mm -hmm. Well, on the SRE side, they're more about like, okay, Reliability, right? Yeah. How can we monitor this? How are we, you know, do we have our SLOs and SLIs in place? And, um, you know, if it goes out of whack, we can need to make sure we're, you know, coming back and fixing that. So they're not, they're two things, but slightly different. Like, <laughs> but, and they all do, and they're all focused on automation and making sure, um, you know, develop, developer lives are much easier and they can focus on getting their features out the door. Gotcha. And yep. like yesterday in one of the talks, right, I think the first talk that Pete did, uh, he spoke about how before DevOps, there was an IT team and there was a dev team. Correct. And then the whole po point of DevOps was to make sure that they work together and we break that break down that barrier. Yep. And now they're with after DevOps, the next iteration sounds like platform engineering, where there is again that central team who's building that platform for these DevOps and developers to to push code on. Yep. Do you think that it's cyclical and we're going back to the old ways of doing things or <laughs> this actually has a benefit? I think it's a slippery slope. So yeah. if a platform engineering gets too overzealous, they can like create more of a, a, a locked world where you can only do it this way yeah. and the developer teams can't do it. I mean, I, you know, when a platform team emerges, they should really think about, okay, here's the golden path, right? So this is the easy way, but we can, you can either provide to the platform so you can expand it to like what you want or, um, or outside that box, like, you know, you can go way outside that box and just do what you want. Um, okay. But providing those two two features to a developer or the development team so that they can choose like, okay, I'll, I'll take the easy path or I'll might, oh, I don't like your easy path. I'm going to try my hard part. But then they're going to be bogged down with all of the usual stuff where like, oh, I got to do my own CACD pipeline. I got to do my own automation. I got to make sure all this is, in, you know, <laughs> um, security and uh, compliance and all that stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, so one thing I've noticed, and I, I think I mentioned to it yesterday or maybe this morning was I noticed there was a lot of talks about observability this time okay. around. Yep. Um, now, can you tell me about maybe the, a little bit of the importance of observability in sort of your day job, maybe yeah. even or, or just more conceptually? <laughs> uh, for my day job, observability is like the last part of it. Like, okay. um, a lot of times we're letting the teams in our, in at takeoff, we're letting the teams kind of figure out their observability. And we're trying to find the right way to communicate that to them to make sure they're putting in the right metrics. Um, so we're still learning on how to do that in our world. Um, and we're also, you know, uh, dog fooding it ourselves and making sure that we put our own SLOs um, on all the services that we maintain. Um, so for example, some of the networking stuff that we do, you know, we just put in some SLAs or SLOs, sorry, in place so that we're monitoring that in a more SRE type fashion versus just like random metrics. And something goes down and we get alerted kind of thing because that obviously leads to burnout as well when we have yep. <laughs> too many alerts. So as part of your day job, right, do you see like the SRE team giving a lot of feedback to the developers? Because we have heard terms like observability driven development. Yep. Like, do you see that metrics that you care about for from a reliability perspective going back into the dev cycle and making its way all the way in the application stack? Yeah, we're trying to figure that out. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we I wish we had that um, that kind of uh, feedback, but we're we're still still trying to figure that out. So. Okay. Yep. Awesome. So, do you have a team of uh, just SREs, or do you also have the split between SRE platform those kinds? Of uh, we just have SRE. Okay. Um, the way that our domain structure is set up, we have, you know, obviously our product domains and then we have our domain production domain, which is half SRE and half like a QA okay. um, or SDETs. And, and so we're trying to like merge together to be like one big kind of SRE team, but they're two different things because 
um, <clears throat> the QA team was kind of put in place as a release engineering team okay. to put out uh, essentially a, a release train every two weeks. We're trying to get away from obviously that because that's not DevOps focused <laughs> anymore. Uh, and everybody's on board of that. It's just uh, slowly kind of getting there, right? Um, as an architecture. It's like, uh, if there's another name for that, maybe extreme waterfall or like super fast <laughs> waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's fair. I mean, and, and I think there's pockets of DevOps at various, you know, places in, yeah. in Correct. different yeah. companies and stuff yep. like that. They're all different phases. Yep. Like you said, there's a lot of people who are still looking, you know, to enter this community. So the right. one-on-one track here is really valuable, especially, I think, if, especially you kind of coming from the background of SRE and coming yep. to this conference for a long time, it's easy to forget that someone's just walking into this whole True. community. Yep. I almost nice. called it mess. <laughs> right? I, I wasn't going to be that mean about it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I want to switch gears a little bit because I, uh, yeah. yesterday I feel like I had a really interesting conversation with you about um, the, the metrics around cost and what that means for running platforms oh, right. right um and so we've talked to a few individuals who are moving away from kubernetes even um now i'd love to hear your thought on that yes. and and if you could talk a little bit more about that. oh for sure yeah we're we're definitely in the process of getting rid of kubernetes uh you know for our standard runtime okay. um uh, and the main for the reason for that is cost because uh, the way that we architected our system was we had you know an environment or a kubernetes stack per customer and so when you have 10 customers, you have 10 Kubernetes clusters and ah, okay. each one of them yeah. costs a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and, and then we have, you know, multiple environments, right? So static environments that don't need to be around as well. <clears throat> so we had a couple of projects going on. <clears throat> one was to make that all ephemeral, right? So we can make ephemeral environments, uh, bring up GKE, mm -hmm. deploy all the stuff, give it a new, you know, base domain name and away we go, right? Um, that took a while to build. We're <laughs> we actually <laughs> excited that we built it and got it out there. Um, and that saved a lot of money on our non-prod environments or mm -hmm. de development environments or in QAI, as we call them. Okay. <laughs> um, so that saved a ton of money. Um, and, but we're also trying to focus, you know, rewrite our platform into Go from Clojure. And with that, we're focused on um, serverless technologies. So Cloud Functions, Cloud Run, yeah. <clears throat> because we're a Google shop. And... Um, by doing that, it's much more, you know, obviously you don't pay, you only pay for usage at that yep. point. And our usage is much, is very bursty. So it's never a constant, you know, we never have a constant number of you know, okay. requests per second. So, so that, that's where it comes into play where it's like, well, you know, <clears throat> we only pay for when we, when we use it. Yeah. Interesting. So you scenario. still see the benefits of containerization and that's how yep. developers are building code. But then instead Correct. of managing Kubernetes clusters, you just let Google orchestrate Correct. them whenever they you have. got it. Okay. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Very cool. So, yep. um, you know, one of the things I think that's interesting is that's um, a use case that, or I should say it's use case dependent, right? right. Yep. Uh, because in some scenarios you, you would want to maintain at least some level of, of, you know, compute, I'll call it doesn't have yep. to be Kubernetes. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to, you know, sacrifice those warm up times or those kind of things. Yep. Um, have you chosen, um, the Go pro programming language for specific reasons. I'm, I heard you mention that. I'm curious about that. Yeah, mostly because the market, you know, the development market is more geared towards Go now, okay. um, uh, for sure. Because you know, we do definitely don't want to do Java um, because Closure is Java, and there's not <laughs> Closure developers are hard to find, um, and enough. and there's a lot more Go develop development out there, and it's you know, it's just a simpler language for anybody to actually pick up and learn because um, it's way, you know, so many open source projects using it, uh, Kubernetes, Terraform, everything. And you know? it's yep, like, yeah. you, you look at, you look at anything new and it's pretty much, it's go, <laughs> it's written in go. Always a few new rust things out there, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think more development is doing, is doing that. Um, you know, there's still, there's some Python, we have some Python and such, but yeah. for the most part, it's mostly because of the, mar you know, developer market. It's easier to find people writing go language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, very cool. Um, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show. And uh, can people find more uh, about what you're working on? Can they contact you, find you on LinkedIn? How, how do you want to do that? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I just fly underneath the radar. So um, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't blog post. I don't. This is my first podcast. So. Um, but yeah, you can reach out, reach, uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, I can, you know, give, uh, you know, give the, give the guys, I, uh, my, 
LinkedIn information. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it again. And thanks for coming on the show, Kevin. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Kubernetes Bytes podcast. 